Yeah, I think I will just start uh, by introduct uh, by doing some introduction to our, to myself and also our guest speaker uh, of the seminar. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm Li Huang, a postdoc in the MCI. I'm grateful not only because I'm part of uh, hosting this very first seminar this year, but also because we have a very special guest, Dr. Song Gao from the University of Wisconsin Medicine uh, as our guest uh, seminar speaker. So Dr. Gao is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at the UW Medicine. Uh, his research areas uh, cover geographic information science, geospatial artificial intelligence, geobig data, and human mobility. He has a very ex excellent uh, research record with over 50 peer-reviewed articles in prominent journals for in the last 10 years, and some of them have been widely cited. He currently is an uh, associate editor for the journals of Annals of GIS, editorial board members of Scientific Reports, Plus One, Calligraphy, and Geographic Information Science. Dr. Gao is also the director of the Geospatial Data Science Lab at the U UW Medicine. Uh, his lab has been working on several research programs uh, with the funding from National Science Foundation, American Family Insurance Data Science Institute, and also Microsoft AI for Earth. The most recent and the emergent program he has is a ESF funded program in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So in today's seminar, he will be sharing with us about the progress and the outcomes of this program and talking about how human mobility, mobility analysis based on the big data could inform COVID-19 geospatial spread pattern and also the public health policies. So after the seminar, he will also stay with us for another hour for an informal conversation. Additional questions and brainstorming. So you are very welcome to join us for this part as well, uh, within the same meeting room in the Zoom. So now please uh, let, us see, uh, let us give a big round of applause and a warm welcome to Dr. Song Gao. Um, so uh, Dr. Gao, uh, please go take it over here. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Huang, for your kind introduction. And it's my great pleasure to present in this uh, seminar. And I do want to mention that I actually visited the University of Idaho uh, several years ago. I remember it's still in the same month. And uh, I, I uh, really enjoy your campus. And uh, also I remember the student uh, hall. Um, it's, it's great. I had uh, some good experience there. And so I want to say thank you for your uh, invitation. Uh, now I'd like to share our recent work uh, on the uh, COVID-19. And so as Dr. Huang introduced, uh, we got a NSF um, rapid award for this work about uh, mapping the multi-scale um, human mobility changes and geospatial modeling of COVID-19 spread. Uh, this is a collaborative work um, by my team, including myself as a PI and also three co-PIs Dr. Ching Li from Mathematics, uh, Dr. Kai Ping Chen from Life Science Communication, and Dr. Jonathan Pass from Public Health. And our students uh, are from Geography, Computer Science, and Statistics, and Public Health. And I would like to start with um, my, re my core research area about uh, modeling human mobility or understanding you know, the human place interaction. Uh, there are a couple of sources to analyze human mobility patterns, including uh, like a travel, travel survey, social media, uh, phone call detail records, and the location-based services. So I use, uh, you know, those following characteristics to describe each source, uh, including whether they have a spatial information, social relation, and the activity information and what its characteristics. 
So let's start with travel survey. So this is a well-known and then also traditional uh, data source. It has a rich, you know, spatial or detailed information and also the social relations such as the number of, you know, people in this travel and then the activity types such as where you go and what kind of activities and purposes you did. So we think that uh, this traditional source uh, although it has a relatively small sample because it's very expensive, but it uh, has rich semantics. And uh, recently there emerging the social media study. And as we know, when people post in social media, they could include a, a coordinate information from the mobile device. It can also mention place names. So I uh, characterize as, you know, the spatial information maybe, and for the social relation, as we know, based on some data mining or, you know, test analysis, we may be able to extract some of the social relation on the social media posts between different users. And for the activity, when they, you know, like do the checking, mean that they visited a place or point of interest, they may also review their activity information. So for the social media, it has a large sample, but it is relatively sparse regarding the sampling rate. And the third type is a phone call detail records, uh, like Dr. Huang and myself, uh, when we were uh, at uh, Peking University, we intensively uh, worked with the phone call detail records. So uh, it contain uh, spatial information, social information, uh, but uh, you know, it's a passive tracking. It doesn't have the activity information. We do need to do some uh, activity inference. So it's also a large sample and dense sample, uh, but uh, it's really hard to get access. So last but not least, uh, the increasing availability of the location-based services in smartphones and um, you know, many uh, mobile apps track the users when they opt in the services and it has rich spatial information and if it is a location-based social network, it may also have a social relation such as following and followers. And it can also, also review the activity information. So we categorize as also large sample and, but the real quail, the enterprise access, which means that actually uh, those like research institute or data science team in, in, in enterprise actually has a priority to do this kind of human mobility analysis. So one thing we saw during the past year, um, the COVID-19 is actually the mobility open data spring up phenomenon. So which means that a lot of enterprises, they actually uh, make those human mobility data publicly available. So in abetting the COVID-19. So I think uh, this is really great for research. Uh, you can see uh, here a list of a list of those data sources that uh, they provide different kinds of uh, mobility and social distancing uh, dashboard or the raw data sets uh, for, you, for researchers to analyze. So this is how we came up our idea how to utilize the human mobility data and to understand, you know, uh, first of all, the response of human behavior as a second, how to utilize the mobility data to do some COVID-19 uh, modeling. So we started, we started with the you know, very exploratory analysis. So that is the first thing we did. Uh, in early March, we launched a dashboard and utilize um, the mobile phone tracking data. And first of all, uh, in this, uh, platform, we build a dashboard as an interface. I will show you in a moment. But uh, at the back end, we, you know, retrieve the data from uh, enterprise and then we process the data and we extract several metrics regarding the mobility patterns, such as the median travel distance and the home dwell time. And we use different uh, summary statistics and to further push to the web interface. And at the interface side, uh, we provide the interactive uh, map-based visualization uh, for you know, the users and to understand the mobility pattern and to inform some of the public health uh, decision support. 
And at the application level, uh, I will show you in a moment, we have different uh, scenarios, but this is uh, uh, our framework. And this is a uh, uh, animation about uh, uh, in, you know, in, in March, how the national mobility pattern has changed in response to the COVID-19. And in this map, uh, the baseline was the mobility pattern, the median travel distance in February, 2020. And then um, each day we compute the, you know, the ratio uh, of that uh, matrix compared to the, you know, the baseline and to say, how does that change? And so if it is a shoe as red means that the increasing mobility, if it is blue and decreasing uh, mobility, and then uh, the color, the color uh, lightness um, or the darkness also show the intensity. So I'm going to play just uh, very quick. This is the daily changes. You can see before the declaration of the uh, lockdown and you can see a large red, but after that, you know, going blue and dark blue, so national white. So we can really see uh, the spatial temporal patterns uh, of the mobility patterns. And also uh, that is the aggregation level at the more local level, based on the indi individual level uh, location tracking, but this is also anonymized. We do not know uh, who they are, uh, but uh, only know there is a device. And we can, uh, for instance, uh, we can analyze large scale location pings and we can also focus on specific point of interest. For instance, at the UW, uh, this is our hospital, and uh, UW Health Hospital, and we can analyze, uh, you know, where are those visitors come from? Uh, this is the uh, origin to destination uh, visit flows uh, in our uh, UW Health. And uh, we also make some efforts at the local level in addition to the national level mapping. And this is a uh, uh, Ding County, uh, which is where we are at uh, Madison, Ding County Social Distancing Dashboard. So in this dashboard, uh, in addition to the uh, travel distance, we also uh, analyze more fine spatial resolution that is a, a sensor block group level about the uh, stay at home time. Also, this is the daily changes. And the third indices, uh, the third index is about the close, average close contact because, uh, you know, when two devices stay close, you know, stay close and for a certain amount of time, such as five minutes or 15 minutes, and then we can define as a close contact detected by the mobile devices. And then if we average by a sensor tract or sensor block group, and then we'll know uh, such a close contact pattern over time. So uh, actually uh, our local decision makers and also campus wide the leadership uh, do look at the, uh, this dashboard to see you know, how, the, how the people uh, here uh, respond, you know, was the adherence level to this different policies. So we found the really uh, rely on those large scale uh, mobility data, uh, we can, you know, provide such a information dashboard to inform the decision making. And that is more like a service, uh, you know, effort. And we also do uh, some research. Uh, in the following, I will share uh, several of our works uh, all published uh, about, uh, you know, in the research site, what we did uh, for, for this effort. Uh, the first work we did is very simple. We just uh, think about uh, how the change of mobility and with association with the you know, growth rate of the COVID-19 cases in the whole US. So uh, we look at the first four, we do some uh, curve fitting and based on the observed uh, confirmed cases data in each state. And then we also uh, do a you know, simple correlation analysis about the change rate of the travel distance and also the stay at home time change to the growth rate 
of the COVID-19 cases. So one thing you can see is that, uh, first of all, the travel distance change rate was negatively uh, associated with uh, growth of the COVID-19 cases. And then the stay at home time is positively associated with the growth rate of the COVID-19 cases. So in other words, at the beginning, uh, in areas where there are more severe, you know, COVID-19 infections, um, people actually uh, follow the, you know, the stay-at-home order better and have a higher adherence, you know, level because they stay at home more and also travel less. And uh, also, we also did the, uh, you know, uh, you know, based on both empirical analysis and then the modeling analysis using the uh, some simple uh, mechanistic model and we can see that uh, before the you know stay at the home order in each state and after the stay at the home order in each state um, they are about uh, um, you know two weeks or one week depending on which state because we take the uh, study period up to uh, mid April at that time and we can find out, although there is some uh, variation regarding the doubling time, that is the time take, you know, took for the infer confirmed cases doubled. And we can see that before the order, uh, the peak time, you know, it's around uh, 2.7 days. But after the stay at home order implemented, it delayed to a uh, the median is about six days. So the larger days of the doubling time means that the reduced transmission of the COVID-19. So which means that uh, uh, as, we, as we expect, yeah, the stay at home water uh, indeed uh, work well in reducing the, uh, the COVID-19 transmission. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of debates. We can you know, talk more after the presentation uh, because uh, later studies found that uh, we may not need uh, such a, you know, completely lockdown, right? So we can have a different uh, non-pharmaceutical -pharma intervention measures, such as wearing masks, social distancing, limiting the gathering size. There are a lot of, you know, modeling efforts uh, showing that, you know, the completely lockdown uh, may not be necessary. But uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the earliest work we showed that such a, you know, national-wide coordination effort is needed, uh, you know, at, especially at the beginning of, of this pandemic. Uh, so our, this wor uh, our work uh, was also uh, reported by uh, CNN Health. And the second the part, so when we uh, did our work, we also realized the importance of the uh, origin to destination uh, flow data in the modeling and because we receive a lot of requests uh, to make this data public available and although there are already uh, uh, some efforts from the enterprise such as uh, SafeGraph, they already make uh, their you know, aggregation mobility data available. However, there is still a gap between the sampling the mobile device sampling and also the meta population modeling requirement, which which means that in those uh, compartment model, we need a meta population, which means that is a population level estimates. But uh, mobile phone, you know, is no matter how large it is, is only a sampling. So we need to infer the entire population movement. So this is why we uh, further try to infer the entire population movement across the US and also make this as open data. Um, so this is uh, open data. Um, we, uh, we collaborated with SafeGraph and then make it publicly available on GitHub. And we provide a three geographic level arranging to destination uh, flow data. So uh, at the state to state level and uh, the county to county level and also the sensor track to sensor track level, the three uh, geographic scales. You can see that, uh, for example, from this map, you can see that uh, there are you know, still intensive 
uh, interstate travel at the first week of March 2020. Uh, but uh, you know, when the country went to lockdown, uh, there are much, much less long distance travel uh, in at the beginning of the April. And then, but after uh, mid May, uh, you can see uh, more travel, you know, uh, re rebound. So, you know, which means that as we know that uh, uh, at the beginning of the June, after a lot of states reopened the business, uh, you know, uh, we can see that uh, a lot of travel going on uh, at the end of May and June, uh, which we believe actually uh, might, uh, you know, in indicate some of those second, we call maybe second wave uh, in their, uh, in their, you know, transmission in the US. So this is a sensor track to sensor track level at uh, New York. And I here I'd like to talk uh, talk a little bit more about the methodology. Um, first of all, um, to the to the best of knowledge, and most of the current enterprise mobile sample um, only provide a ten percent of the entire population to researchers. So it doesn't mean that they don't have that, but this is like a you know a business standard. Uh, only if you are, you know, you working in their data science team with an enterprise, uh, you may not have access to the full, you know, uh, full database. So this is uh, like a business standard. Uh, we only have about 10% of the sample. So this is why we need to utilize those 10% and also the US census, American Community Survey data to further infer the population level flow. So that is uh, the key idea in this data uh, preparation effort. Yeah, we, based on the ratio of the, you know, uh, uh, penetration about the mobile devices, and uh, this is uh, specific about the ac number of active devices in um, each, you know, each sensor tract and, and on each day. And then we can do such a computation to infer uh, the population flow. And because I, I have been working on the human mobility uh, area for a long time, um, we know that there are two uh, classic models to understand the human mobility pattern, what we call spatial interaction patterns. So namely the gravity model and then the radiation model. And the gravity model uh, is for the undirected interaction network. The radiation model is for the directed uh, interaction network. So in the gravity model, we assume that, um, you know, the flow between two places, I and J, uh, is in portion to its population at the origin destination, PIPJ, respectively, and then in reverse portion to the distance between the location I and J and have some dif different distance decay phenomenon beta. So by calibrating the observation data, we can find out the different, uh, you know, uh, constant K and also the distance decay uh, beta. And we can utilize the model to also further infer the population level uh, flow. And similarly, uh, for the radiation model, uh, one key assumption is that uh, we consider the direction of the flow. So which means that we assume that uh, based from one origin to you know, different destinations, the interaction flow or you know, will like uh, the radiation in the transport of light. So uh, this is um, in both model actually are from uh, physics. So this is uh, what we calibrate the model and uh, in the uh, county level data. And we, as expected, because our uh, flow data is directed, which means it has a direction. Uh, we can see that the radiation model um, works better than the uh, gravity model. Because we don't have a ground truth 
So, but uh, you know, when you publish or release a data set, uh, people definitely care about the quality, right? So we do need uh, some validation. Because of no ground truth, we can only do some cross validation. So this is why we compare with other open data source uh, regarding such as the uh, temporal patterns and to see the, for regarding the different the geography scale, what is the uh, temporal, you know, uh, temp the temporal similarity between different sources. Uh, we, we found actually um, generally there are high correlation coefficients, uh, mostly are greater than 0 0.9 uh, in Pearson correlation. This is why we believe uh, those data source uh, do reflect uh, the overall pattern about the mobility changes uh, can be trusted. Uh, so lastly, and when we, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, when we prepare the data sets, the purpose is to utilize the mobility data set in the COVID-19 uh, spread modeling effort. So we also did the, uh, you know, this direction. And one modification we made because we really, uh, we are really interested in the human mobility and geospatial spread. So this is why, uh, we made a, a modification to the traditional uh, comparison model, the well-known uh, SEIR model. So S here represents the group of people with a susceptible and then exposed for the E uh, component. And then for the I, the infection part, we also uh, made some minor changes. We consider especially uh, reflect the early, early state in the US uh, there are a lot of unreported cases and because of the limited testing capacity. So this is why we differentiate those are officially reported, you know, confirmed, but also those unreported cases. So this is also another uh, difference we made. And we think that those unreported cases, you know, when they travel across the states actually cause a lot of, you know, uh, potential transmissions, uh, but undetected. So this is why uh, we added those, uh, you know, uh, interaction terms in the traditional uh, compartment epi epidemiology modeling, and you know, to do the modeling effort. And um, in order to do the modeling, first of all, we need to, you know, calibrate the parameters. In addition to uh, using the clinical data based on existing publications, we also need to, you know, uh, fit the observation data in, you know, in the in each state at in March. Uh, we utilize um, a Bayesian uh, inference framework. Uh, you know, this is the flow chart of the data assimilation process. Uh, which means that, uh, you know, we have a historical observation data in each state about their confirmed cases. And we want to find out those, you know, best fitting parameters that can reflect the, you know, the evolution of those, uh, the ODE, ODE, those ordinary differential equation system describe the epidemic, uh, you know, transmission uh, mechanism I shared earlier in the compartment model. And so based on the, uh, this data simulation, uh, one striking thing we found was that, you know, in each state in March, there was only about 22% in average of the confirmed cases were reported. So which means that uh, a lot of undetected were, you know, there, there could be very comprehensive, comprehensive reasons could be lack of testing capacity at that time, or could be maybe because of the limitation of the resources. People just, you know, stay at home or didn't go to the, you know, uh, the hospital. And there are many, you know, uh, unknown reasons, but based on the modeling effort and data, uh, you know, fitting, uh, we found out across the US, there are only about 22% in, in March. So this is uh, the timing, but uh, we believe definitely uh, as time goes on, the more, uh, the increasing testing capacity, uh, this number definitely, you know, uh, was higher actually. So, uh, but based on this observation, 
what we did is to do their prediction, right, about the geospatial spreads. So we control different uh, scenarios in the in the simulation. And uh, first of all, if all the parameters took the initial value, so uh, sorry for the color, it looks more, it's very scary because uh, you'll see uh, very rapidly the whole US is in red, right? So it's very dangerous if we didn't do anything, no control at all. And what about if we control the interstate flow, reduced to 5%, or uh, we actually try different percentage. And why other parameter value remain unchanged, we found actually uh, because that, at that time, the spread already happening across the whole US. So the travel flow, when the spread already happening in each state, the travel flow really doesn't matter in this case. If you think about it, that's actually understandable because you know the importance is about when a case moves to a local, how you control that, that case. Do you put it in quarantine isolation, right? Rather than, you know, about you know, from zero to one. So this is a different story. So this is why uh, we think that uh, for starting from the C, uh, increasing testing capacity and then the reporting rate. So keep in mind that the 22% reporting rate on average at the beginning, and then reduce the transmission rate beta and to 0.1 of the original value. And also if you increase the reporting rate R and also reducing the transmission rate beta at the same time, we found this is most uh, effective based on the uh, modeling effort. So that is shown in E. So um, lastly, uh, based on this modeling, as I said, we can provide a state specific information. So for instance, uh, based on the parameter, we can know that uh, for instance, when we have a, you know, um, confirmed cases, if we delay the isolation time, this is a, the, the figure show that uh, the impact of the susceptible population regarding the delay of the quarantine and isolation. So you can find out such in, at that time because New York and Michigan has a really high confirmed cases. For those states, if they delay those confirmed cases regarding the isolation only about two days, you will see that those susceptible group of people will reduce significantly. However, in some you know, less severe states, we may be able to maybe tolerate a little bit, maybe about 3.6 days is okay. But after that, your population in that state will also you know, significantly reduce or will be infected at large. So here uh, in summary, uh, such a modeling effort, we have uh, two implications. So first of all, uh, we understand the, you know, the mechanism about the human mobility, you know, regarding the spatial interaction between different states. On the other hand, we also understand the importance of the testing and then reporting, and also the delay of the, or the time, timing of the isolation. So we think that uh, this effort uh, is directly linking to the, uh, some of the policy uh, making support. And um, after do this work, uh, so we really, <laughs> you can say we made a very, we, we make the various kind of dashboards. So this is another dashboard uh, we made based on this modeling effort. So you can see that uh, based on our uh, modeling framework, uh, we can change whether you want to, you know, reduce or control the travel or not, the transmission rate, uh, the beta, and also the detection and reporting rate, uh, the R, and also you can see the, you know, the time series of different uh, compartments and also uh, for each state over time. So this is also uh, the dashboard we made, and also we uh, we shared our code and data uh, to replicate or reproduce uh, this work on GitHub as well. So summary, um, based on my talk, you can see that uh, mobile phone data 
can help track the mobility patterns. And also some of them also use mobile phone data to do the digital contact tracing here. Uh, I didn't show uh, this part, but uh, yeah, this is a well-known uh, also ongoing issue using the digital contact tracing. So at our campus actually uh, in the spring, uh, we'll also use a digital contact tracing app at the UW Medicine as well called the Safe, uh, Safe Badger. And second, um, the, we can also see the spatial and temporal heterogeneity of the transmission regarding you know, each state and also different, you know, peak time, and they're also uh, related. And uh, based on our research, we also found the, you know, regarding different neighborhoods, uh, the health and social disparities also require more attention because uh, we, we know that uh, COVID-19 uh, impacts uh, different neighborhoods, different group people, uh, importantly. And uh, one lesson where I think, uh, Based on you know all different kind of research, I I found it very beneficial. It definitely working with different expertise. So this is the first time I feel uh, really uh, we need uh, such a large group of a different expertise to work on just one issue. So that is uh, something that I learned a lot uh, through this uh, project. So we need a coordination, and we also need the multidisciplinary collaboration effort to combine the pandemic. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and open for any questions or suggestions. Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gao. Uh, it's very intuitive for me and, me, uh, and also for our uh, you know, policies and public response to the COVID-19. Uh, so before we move to the q and I want to re uh, restate that uh, we are going to have an informal discussion with Dr. Gao. If we do not have uh, enough time for all the questions, you are very, very welcome to stay with us uh, for, a, uh, for another hour. So uh, thanks, Dr. Gao. Um, so yeah, I think uh, there's uh, already one question in the chat uh, from Jennifer. The question is that, uh, are you using Bluetooth data or just the GPS to detect uh, close contacts? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, uh, the, the work I show only using the GPS location. Yeah, but uh, I know that uh, there are other groups. Uh, they are also using the uh, Bluetooth and also some of the uh, uh, astot astotics uh, sensor in the mobile phones um, to, do the con the contact detection, um, but so yeah, in in our case, we only use the GPS location data. Yeah, thank you. So, can I ask some other questions about close contacts? Yes, please. So, um, so if people stay home and they have their cell phones at home. There are all each other's close contacts and they're close contacts for a lot of time, presumably. Yeah. Um, how does that affect your analysis? Do you have a way of taking into account home close contacts versus out and about close contacts? Yeah, thank you, Holly. This is actually an excellent question. Uh, in, in our uh, current wars, uh, First of all, this is a really challenging, you know, uh, task, and we actually uh, did find a good way uh, to actually to differentiate this. And one thing I do want to mention that uh, I also tried approach that is is more like out of home activities or out of home gathering to differentiate the stay at home activities. So that is uh, a straightforward thing to do. But if we want to really, because um, if we want to really differentiate the close contact in both residential area and then the non-residential areas, and then you really need the, the whole trajectory of you know each individual. So this is uh, definitely uh, is more challenging. We didn't do at the national scale, uh, but uh, 
uh, we actually were, uh, we are trying to do at the local scale, such as the Ding County, because we, we do have the, the whole data for the Ding County uh, because of local uh, depart, uh, DHS support, yeah. So do you just assume that home is where the phone is at night or home is where the phone spends the most time or? Oh, I see. Uh, for the stay at home, uh, there are, yeah, there are several algorithms. And in this case, uh, yes, um, you know, there, there, there are two data sets we are working on. So one data set is provided by SafeGraph. Uh, their algorithm was based on that if there is a, you know, consecutive, uh, I forgot a stack six days or seven days, and then at the night location, and then because you will have different uh, locations, but it's a cluster of locations, and then they use a, a density-based spatial clustering algorithm called dbscan, and to cluster, you know, those points as the home cluster and assign that cluster as the home. And if, if you know, it stay in that range and they will, you know, uh, mark as the stay at home pin location. So that is what they did. And for us, uh, for the individual level data, uh, there is another approach uh, we call it the return rate. So in other words, no matter, you know, you, you travel from A to B and A to C or A to D, so you are returned to A. So based on the return frequency, uh, we'll know that A is your, you know, major residence place. So uh, in, the, in, the, in this domain, uh, those are the two popular algorithms to detect the home location or state. And you don't have any sort of metadata about the people to go with this, right? So you don't know ages or gender or... Yeah, unfortunately, no. That's why, otherwise, people will scare. <laughs> this is already scared. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very good question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Uh, I think there's another question in the chat uh, from Amanda. Uh, have you considered looking at the effects of uh, heterogeneity in various strings, like the new UK string, uh, B117? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, Amanda, uh, we, we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't do it yet, uh, but this is definitely uh, a very interesting uh, and also urgent uh, research direction. And one thing, uh, we, you know, we just, uh, because we have a weekly meeting uh, within UW, uh, we chatted about this and we, we are thinking if regarding the modeling and we have to rely on some of the publication reports about those changing parameters. And then, um, you know, we may maybe do some tasks, but uh, uh, looking, at, looking ahead, uh, what we think is actually not only the variant, but also like, uh, because we focus on human response. So how about maybe the voluntary, uh, you know, or the willing, voluntary willingness of the vaccination <laughs> about right different percentages of the voluntary vaccination may also have, a, have the impact about the, the further control. So uh, we feel that uh, if we want to do some, something new, uh, we have to uh, link all those uh, emerging uh, dynamics. So, but uh, yeah, this is a very good question. Another question from Jennifer. So the effect of the mobility and transmission seems to have decreased the increased adherence level to the mask recommendation. Uh, can you see that in your mobility SDR model? Uh, so uh, because um, at that time, uh, actually even so far, we didn't find a, a very good uh, data source about the you know the the mask wearing, uh, you know practice. So we know there there is a, a national survey uh, conducted by uh, another group uh, about uh, the people's willingness to wear masks 
but uh, we didn't um, do the, we didn't consider the mask uh, in our modeling. But uh, the, the mobility transmission. So in our case, yeah, I see. Uh, in our, you know, in our uh, comparison work about the, um, you know, mobility and stay at home and then the increased of the COVID-19 infection, uh, it's more like, uh, because it is an association analysis, it's not a causal inference. So it's more like a top, is a top-down design. We consider all kinds of variables or even we don't know, we, you know, we can only investigate certain uh, variables or factors that uh, you know we are able to to do based given the data availability. But uh, yeah, it's a just the association analysis. Um, it's not a causal analysis. Yeah, not sure <laughs> I answer your question correctly. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think there's another question from Eric. Uh, any thoughts on using sentiment analysis of uh, social media to understand changing social uh, temporal pers perspective on, on mask wearing, et cetera? Uh, uh, the question yeah. is in the chat. So. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, so uh, this is actually a part of the second part of our uh, proposal. Uh, we are actually uh, interested in not only in the sentiment, but also uh, the risk awareness. So I think um, we found that uh, there was a gap, even now still a gap, between the, the, the risk awareness and also the actual infection, because uh, some people still don't believe COVID-19 is happening and <laughs> impact our community, unfortunately. But uh, uh, we, uh, we actually are doing some uh, Twitter uh, data analysis specifically using the, the test analysis uh, to, to understand the different people's risk uh, awareness. So the, the mask wearing is uh, one, um, one dimension. Uh, we also uh, wear wondering uh, their conception or awareness about the digital contact tracing. So based on our preliminary analysis, although I didn't show, but uh, we also found that uh, there is a divide between different uh, geography and also different groups of people about their uh, perception about those uh, digital contact tracing technologies and mask wearing. So, uh, we are still doing the test analysis because uh, the test analysis is uh, much more uh, complicated than uh, the, <laughs> we think than the Masonic modeling. So we, we, are, we are still doing the test analysis. This is a very good point. Special. So Lee, do you? Yes, thank you. Uh I think there's another one from Sky. Uh, what uh, special units do you use for your analysis and how did you decide to use them? Uh, for example, the state, county, urbanized area, block groups, and all those scales. So do you mean the mobility part or the modeling part? Or could be both? <laughs> so, um, so in our, uh, in our case um i think really when we you know uh, start a project uh we look at the two things so first of all and also the most important thing is what kind of insights or what kind of policy implication we can make from this effort so that is the first thing we look at so this is why uh, you can see that uh, uh the the, the two works I shared, uh, we do have a clear uh, policy support implications. The second uh, thing we want to look at is 
is the availability of the data. So that's more critical because otherwise it will be purely theoretical analysis uh, without any uh, empirical analysis. So we need to consider both uh, policy implication and also the data availability uh, to choose our analysis uh, unit. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gao. Actually, I got one question, like it's kind of uh, not very academic about that. Uh, so what are the res uh, so based on your research and your efforts to make it public, so how is the response of the public uh, to your research efforts? Like, uh, did the uh, county or the state government adopted some of your policy recommendations? Uh, because I uh, saw that uh, the, the campus uh, university has adopted some of those and to use uh, big data and the uh, mobility analysis, but how about the governmental level and also public in general? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. Um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, one, one good thing happening, you know, in Wisconsin was that the, the State Department of Health Services really work very closely with our university. So since the pandemic in March, uh, this is how uh, we had a team very early. Um, and uh, we have our uh, university leadership directly uh, talk and communicate with the DHS in our state. And for us, uh, we, we are doing our work, specific work to support our university leadership and they will report to the DHS and also other state officials. And based on, it's more like a, you know, a cycling effort. And I know that uh, some of our, uh, you know, mobility tracking work and also some of the uh, campus modeling work uh, really uh, inform some of those uh, some of the decision making. For instance, more concretely, uh, early in April, um, the the state leadership really would like to know the adherence level of the stay at home for Wisconsin <laughs> residents. So they 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 would like to look at right our mobility dashboard to see how on a daily basis right how our people in Wisconsin responded to the. Uh, stay at home order. Uh, this is the uh, first thing. And later when we want to uh, reopen the campus, so the, the modern team, um, that is more like a service work. Uh, we also want to estimate, for instance, based on the model, uh, how many tests do we need per day or per week, um, you know, to to control the spread on campus. So you can see that uh, we, we do emphasize the testing capacity issue. So we, uh, based on their prediction number, and we can, based on also the testing ratio, uh, we can estimate, uh, you know, the ideal testing, testing capacity uh, per week or per day. And then, you know, the, the university leadership and will make, uh, you know, the further planning for the resource. So this is actually, uh, to me, I think that's, at that point, I really feel, yes, there's such a, even it's more like a ideal modeling because modeling has such, you know, a hypothesis assumption, even unrealistic, but we can really do the scenario analysis, what if, to answer what if question. So I think that's really informative for the decision makers. Yeah, thank you, so. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's uh, almost a time uh, for people, you know, who have a, a company, king, uh, for company king schedules and uh, uh, is going to uh, leave uh, for class or other meetings or something. 
but after all, I want to uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gao, again for joining us and sharing us with your fantastic uh, research. And for people who are thank interested in, to join us uh, for the informal discussion, you are very welcome to stay for another 60 or 50 minutes with us. But uh, at last, uh, I want to give you a big round of applause again and to thank you to, to uh, as, uh, as our seminar speaker. Thanks. Sir.